Welcome everyone to the Lasting Hope Podcast. This is Josh here in the cave. My guest tonight is my friend slash brother, Isaac Simerson. Welcome to the show. Thank you. It's good to be here. Um, I'm just going to have Isaac tell us a little bit about himself real quick. So it's all yours. Well, I guess I'll start with a little bit of my testimony. Um, I grew up in a Christian family. I had lots of siblings that all believed in the Lord. Um, Parents believed. Um, went through a few upheavals um, over time about the age of 13 I went through kind of a spell where I was not following the Lord it followed up until I was about 19 years old I came back and first thing he said was wait I was like okay I can I can do that but are you sure you don't want me to do something <laughs> you know and um, so I spent the first little bit waiting got a job you know all the things that a responsible person should do but as I was at this job, um, Lifehouse, their youth group, had a event coming up where they were going to be checking out a college in Grand Rapids called North Point. Well, they asked me if I could chaperone, and I was like, yeah, sure, I'm you know, not really thinking about it. We went down, I chaperoned, went around with the kids, checked out some classes, and I was like, I know this is where I need to be, right? So I'm back at work, Tim Hortons, making donuts, coffee. And by the end of the night, it's raining and I'm in my car and I'm like, God, I know this is what I've been waiting for. I know this is where you want me to be. I'm throwing out the fleece. Could you leave it wet? I need to know if this is right. Turned on the radio and sure enough, there was a, you know, advertisement for North Point for the exact program that I was looking to get into. I was like, all right, I need to bust butt because it's the end of the summer. I don't have much time. So I've been to North Point. Um, my brother actually graduated from there. I have admittedly have not yet, but um, I enjoyed my time there. Teachers, very well spoken, um, great people, definitely all believers and all very good at what they do. Um, I will tell you right now, I am not an expert. I have thoughts. I have researched some things. I will give you some thoughts while we're doing this podcast, but. I will let you know there are other people who are more qualified, and I'll let you know if there are people that would probably be better. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's me. You got further than I did. (laughs) Um, So um, Isaac's brother is Elijah. They're both my wife's brothers. Um, Elijah was on the last podcast, if that gives you any any background as to what I married into. Um, (laughs) But... I thought a good book for us to talk about tonight, yes, we're going to talk about an entire book tonight, and really, it's one of the first stories that we hear growing up as kids. It's the book of Jonah. It's four chapters long, but it's such a fun chapter. Um, It's not a fun chapter, but to study, it's it's actually quite a fun chapter. I've, I've spent a lot of time, I've probably read it 10 or 11 times in the last couple of weeks, just trying to get a full grasp on it. Um, But mainly, my point is it's more than a fish. Yeah. It's, you know, when you're little kids, it's, yeah, this guy Jonah got swallowed by a fish, and then he got puked up on the beach. And that's about as far as, for me personally, that's as far as it ever went. I just knew that he was swallowed by a fish. And it's a heavy target for skeptics. Yeah. Because, you know, all the research of can a man actually get swallowed by a fish and live three days and get puked up on a beach? Well, we'll get to the three days part in a bit. But as far as the fish... Because you're thinking the same thing I'm thinking. Right. As far as the fish is concerned, um, to be perfectly honest, Jewish taxonomy back in that day was totally different from the way we do things now. We know that, like, whales, dolphins, porpoises, those are all mammals, right, by their classification. If it was in the water, it was a fish. It did not matter. So, you know, jellyfish, um, dolphin, starfish, it was all fish, right? So the only thing that they really separated it by is which ones are edible and which ones are not. And the fish that weren't were the bottom feeders. That's all they cared about. But whether it was a whale or a shark or whatever, that is what the attestation is, is that some giant water creature swallowed Jonah during this time. Yep. But we'll get to the three days part. Of it. Yep. That's the fun part. <laughs> that is the fun part. So I'm just going to start reading here in the first uh, first chapter. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, 
saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah arose to flee to Tar Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So Jonah's fleeing the presence of God because he don't want to do it. Yeah, we've all, we've all done it. And if we look back into what Nineveh was like back in that day, Understandable. Understandably so. And then we get into the storm at sea. So we're on verse 4 here. But the Lord sent out a great wind on the sea, and there was a mighty tempest of the sea, so that the ship was about to be broken up. Then the mariners were afraid, and every man cried out to his God, and threw the cargo that was in the ship into the sea to lighten the load. But Jonah had gone down into the lowest parts of the ship, had lain down, and was fast asleep. So the captain came to him and said to him, what do you mean, sleeper? Arise. Call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. Random little uh, side thought. I think it's interesting that when the disciples are on the sea and Jesus is in the boat, he also is asleep and a storm comes. And they go to him already knowing who he is, right? And they say, we need you to wake up and handle this, right? These mariners, when they talk to Jonah, they're like, you need to wake up and call on your God now. Yeah. The disciples went to Jesus knowing that he was God and said, you need to do something. Not, that's why he called them out. He was like, do you not know, right? Yep. So I just think that's funny because there's other parallels that we'll see later. So verse 7 here. And then they said to one another, come, let us cast lots that we may know for those for whose cause this trouble has come upon us. So they cast lots, and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, Please tell us, for whose cause is this trouble upon us? What is your occupation, and where do you come from? What is your country, and of what people are you? And he said to them, I am a Hebrew, and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and dry land interesting that this immediately gets a response out of them. Yeah. Because for the longest time the Hebrews have already been set apart. They're already a people who are known for following this God, Yahweh. They use Lord in the Old Testament largely because people were afraid of misusing the divine name, which would be the Tetragrammaton. But it's, it's interesting how quickly they are afraid because he has done something wrong to his God. They are not following the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Moses. And they already know they're in trouble because this man is a holy prophet and has screwed up royally. Yeah. Yeah. And we and we see that, you know, in this next little bit. Then the men were exceedingly afraid and said to him, Why have you done this? For the men knew that he fled from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. Then they said to him, What shall we do to you that the sea may be calm for us? And the sea was growing more tempestuous. tempestuous, something like that. Then he said to them, Pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you, for I know that this great tempest is because of me. Nevertheless, the men rode hard to return to the land, but they could not, for the sea continued to grow more tempestuous. It grew more wild against them. Before they cried out to the Lord and said, We pray, O Lord, please do not let us perish for this man's life, and do not charge us with innocent blood, for you, O Lord, have done as it pleased you. So they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. And the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. That is one of the things that I think is just amazing about the story of Jonah. We are looking at the story of a man who is fleeing from the Lord. And even as he is running away, God is still using him to turn people toward him. Yeah. Which is nuts. These men aren't serving other gods. They're, you know, going about their business. Life is great for them. They just happen to get the wrong guy and the sea just goes crazy. And he's like, you need me. You need to throw me overboard. I screwed up and this is the only way to fix this. And their first instinct is not to do that. They are trying their darndest to get this man back to land so he can do what he had to do. But they're already in the thick of it, 
and it's just getting worse. Yep. They were kind and trying to be compassionate when they absolutely did not have to be. Yeah. This man put them and their vessel in trouble, and their first instinct was, we need to save this man. <laughs> yeah. And then as we get into 17, this is a... I'm going to stop here. I'm only going to read a little bit. But now the Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. Now, that part in its own, I've heard described so many ways. The Lord had prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. I've heard people say there was not a fish to that capacity that was big enough, and God prepared a special fish, a one in a million fish. I've heard that God just sent a fish, a whale, whatever you want to call it. So Something. That little sentence on its own creates a whole nother rabbit trail in which you yeah. can go down, but all we have in the inspired Word of God, the Bible, is now the Lord had prepared a great fish. Right. So it doesn't matter how it was prepared. It so was that, prepared. That's what we're sticking to is it was prepared. The three days and three nights thing, yep. right? This is one of the biggest arguments, especially from, you know, anti-theists. I'll call them that because that encompasses, you know, the atheists and all that. Anybody who's against the Bible, they're going to say three days and three nights. There's no way that a man could live that amount of time inside of a creature. A, not enough oxygen. B, you're going to be damaged after that long. Here's the thing. A, Jesus made a comparison between himself and Jonah. Three days and three nights in the belly of the fish, so too shall the Son of Man lie three nights, three days and three nights inside the earth. So, it could be that Jonah straight up died in that fish. But secondly, it's possible he didn't actually spend three days and three nights inside the fish. Um, you see it a few times in the Bible. Um, of course, here in Jonah, we see it in Esther. We see Jesus himself use the term three days and three nights. But the term itself is used as a way to express a long period of time, not specifically three days and three nights. Um, Esther actually asked for her people to pray for her for three days and three nights before she goes to the king. But we see in the account that she immediately goes to the king. So whether or not she was waiting for those three days and three nights to elapse is entirely irrelevant. She just wants them to pray for a long time. Jonah spends a long time in the fish. Jesus, even, like, if we go back to the account, he died on Friday, right? Yep. And then Saturday and Sunday, and he rose on Sunday, right? The way that we consider time is if I say three days later from Friday, you're going to think of Monday. Yes. The way that the Jews counted time, was on the day that something happened, that day would be counted yep, for the one of time. Day one. One, two, three, right? Yep. Thirdly, um, Jesus didn't have to spend that third night in there at all, technically, because the phrase, and this is where context comes into place, ancient context, is that those three days and three nights had more to do with a long time than to do with a specific period of time. Yep. So Jonah could have spent any amount of time in that whale, we don't know. It was long, but whatever the case, it was all miraculous and it was all for a purpose. Yes. Yep. And so the Lord spoke to the fish and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. So you look at, and I just listened to, in our youth group actually, um, we're talking about putting expectations on God. What do we do when those expectations aren't met or they don't come full circle the exact way that we think it's going to happen. Jonah was about to drown in disobedience, quite literally drown and die yeah. in disobedience. But the Lord sent a fish that swat. He didn't send a lifeboat. He didn't send a yacht, cruise ship, with some fly honeys and some booze. <laughs> he sent a fish that swallowed him and took him and literally regurgitated him on to land. Yeah. So... The fish is saving Jonah. Right. Look, if if you got puked up by a fish, you might find that a little bit embarrassing. A little bit. But, I mean, Jonah knew what he did was wrong. Oh, yeah. I, I, if anybody was going to receive some kind of strange, potentially, I don't know, ironic punishment, it would be a prophet who did the wrong thing. Because we're told that people who are in a high position of authority are going to be judged more harshly. And we're already told that sin has its measure of punishment 
as we're alive and also in the after, right? So Jonah, he's saved. What is it going to cost? Yeah. It's not going to be pretty. And with the expectation, too, we, we see that, you know, later on, much later on down the line when Jesus comes. Right. The expectation was, you know, another David, you know, mighty warrior, Joshua, David, Moses, you know, somebody who was going to extrovertly, legitimately lead people out of bondage. Bondage. Of the Romans or of the Ro- Yeah, of the Romans or whoever. So we get back to that expectation thing. They didn't expect for a poor carpenter who was born in a manger to be the savior of the world. So it's no surprise to me when I look back and I actually look at it, it's no surprise to me that they wanted to kill him. No, not at all. Not not at all. Um, So now we get to the next part. We're on chapter 3 now. Uh, Jonah preaches at, at Nineveh. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. So this time he went, accor- or he went according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three-day journey in extent. Mm-hmm. There's another three days. Yeah. And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. Then he cried out and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Interesting choice, forty days. Yep. Um, Why do you think forty days? So, in a lot of... That's why I got you. (laughs) Well, in in prophecy, largely, um, saying days is typically indicative of years, right? And saying weeks is typically indicative of a span of seven years. Specifically, the choice of 40 days has a context to it of, um, oh, what was it? I believe, nope, never mind. Uh, I'm going to backtrack on that. But the 40 days, you'll see that a few times in the Bible, and it has significance. Yeah. Um, Jesus fasts for 40 days in the wilderness. The Israelites spend 40 years wandering the wilderness. There's there's something to that, and we can have a conversation about that at a later podcast. Yeah. I'll sure. do more research. I'll get into it. Um, and speaking of research, there are better you know people out there. I highly recommend Mike Winger, um, great YouTube channel for um, practical applications of the Bible, and um, Michael Jones at Inspiring Philosophy. Really good apologist. He uses just a litany of sources great guy and so if you need you know other resources to get into your bible if you've got questions that your pastor says i don't know do some research you might be surprised and you know talk with more people because not knowing does not suddenly discount the bible it just means that there's more work to do yeah and i i said i didn't say this in our last podcast but i said it to elijah we bring more questions than we bring answers oh yeah in this room we just want to get you thinking and get you to do the research. Yeah. I mean, we don't have an ounce of the answers to the world's questions. But, but best place to start is right here with yep. your Bible. By and large, if you start anywhere, it should be your Bible. Because that is going to, by and large, have very direct answers to your questions. If it does not have an answer, that's where the deeper research, the questioning, the calling out to the Lord, that's where that starts. But start with your Bible. Read regularly. Yeah, so I did some research um, on on Nineveh and what it was like. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, it was wicked, man. It was like, awful. It was, Do you know what Nineveh was? It was the capital mm-hmm. of a nation called Assyria. Um, do you know who founded the nation of Assyria? According to the Old Testament, it's actually listed in the account of Nimrod. And Nimrod, um, the most that we know about him is that it just means rebellious, yeah. suggesting that he was a rebellious leader. And he founded the capital of Assyria. So the man who headed up the construction of the Tower of Babel, the greatest monument to mankind's sin against God, built this city. And was well known for building this city. Of course it's going to be inundated with sin. It was the worst place you could go. Yeah. 
we're going to take a real, a real quick break here. We'll be right back, guys. All right, back to business now. So we're on uh, Jonah chapter 3, verse 5. So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Then word came to the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne and laid aside his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. And he, caused, and he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, Let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily to God. Yes, let everyone turn from his evil way and from the violence that is in his hands. Who can tell if God will turn and relent and turn away from his fierce anger so that we may not perish? This is really interesting. It's suggested that the reason that Jonah was particularly caught off guard by this is that it's easier to go and preach before your people, right? Mm -hmm. To tell them, you're doing well, things need to change. He was essentially being told, and mind you, there's more of this context in Jesus' day, go to the Gentiles. Yep. Go to the worst of the worst, who are not my chosen nation, and tell them about me. Yep. Proclaim me before them. This is easily the hardest that Jonah's ever going to have it. And that's probably why this story is so important, is that he is being told they deserve to hear. They deserve to have an opportunity to repent. That's what Jonah found so confounding, is that he could have just been preaching to his people for the rest of his days, but God called him out and said, you need to go and give these people an opportunity. Yeah. yeah. Relationship with me is worth it. And these people are awful, but they're worth it. Jonah just couldn't wrap his head around that. Yeah, and and two, it's like you know today in the church, church doors need to be open to everybody. Yeah, you know because we are all sinners. We are we're all you know numbered. Right. You know. So at that point, it, it kind of goes back to that of the doors are open to everybody. Now back in in this day. Things were a little bit different. A little bit. But, you know, like like you said, when you're called to preach to people who aren't in your camp, yeah, things get a little bit hairy. A little bit. I mean, we're going to actually talk a little bit more about that on the podcast we're doing tomorrow with uh, our friend James. So, but it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. So he prayed to the Lord and said, Ah, Lord. Was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in love, loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Jonah sounds a lot like the Pharisees yeah. that Jesus encountered here, where he's like, Listen, you sent me to these evil people. I fled because I knew you were merciful. He is claiming here that only he deserves the mercy that he was ready to bring to the Ninevites. Yeah. It's a pity party. It, it's not just a pity party. This man's narcissistic. Yeah. Jonah is so full of himself. Yeah. It's hard to believe. We haven't seen this part. We saw that he ran, yep. that he was scared, but this is utterly despicable. Yeah, it's it's a whole new side of, of Jonah. That, it's like, I knew that you were merciful. That's why I ran. Yep. I I was hoping that I could get away and not have to do this. Yeah, take this cup from me. <laughs> it, right, know. but of course, he didn't want to put God's will first. He wanted to put his will first. He wanted to go and just be done with the Ninevites. Let them be destroyed. And the funny thing is, they will be destroyed eventually. Yeah. Yep. Nineveh will still face destruction. But in this time, there are still people worth saving. Yeah. Yep. And 
and I think maybe next time when you and I do one, we'll look into that that aspect too. That that would be a good one. And so really, in the next little bit here, uh, God just takes the gloves off, man. I mean, this question right here. Then the Lord said, "Is it right for you to be angry?" Like <laughs> he just calls him flat out. He just calls him on his on his stuff. Right. He's like, you know, it wasn't a, it wasn't a, well, you know, it was just a blunt, straightforward, is it right for you to be angry? Right. So Jonah went out of the city and sat on the east side of the city. There he made himself a shelter and sat under it in the shade till he might see what would become of the city. And the Lord God prepared a plan and made it cover up over Jonah that it might be shade for his head to deliver him from his misery. So Jonah was very grateful for the plan. So even after this pity party, or amidst this pity party, yeah. God has prepared a plant to give him some shade so he's not in misery. You know, that, that speaks a lot of our God. It does, and it's even as he's waiting for the destruction of Nineveh. Like, yeah. patiently waiting for this to happen. Yeah. But as the morning dawned the next day, God prepared a worm, and it so damaged the plant that it withered. And it happened when the sun arose that God prepared... A, yeah. Mine says scorching east wind. Scorching east wind, that'll work. And the sun beat on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. Then he wished death for himself and said, "Is It is better for me to die than to live. So we witness yet another little pity party. Then God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the plan? And he said, It is right for me to be angry, even to death. But the Lord said, you have had pity on the plant for which you have not labored, nor made it grow, which came up in the night and perished in the night. And should I not pity Nineveh, what great, that great city, in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and much livestock? That. That's just where it's left off. Yeah. There's no... And Jonah lived happily ever after. There's no, and Jonah faced yep. the wrath of the Lord. There's no, we get to hear what happened to Nineveh. We know what happened to Nineveh based on historical context, but it just leaves it there. Yeah. Why? I think it leaves it there because it's not about what happened to Jonah. Yeah. It's not even about what could happen to us. It is about righteous yeah righteousness and Jonah the whole time that he's even doing the will of God is acting unrighteously I'm going to run I'm going to tell them that they are going to die they deserve to die and I'm going to sit here and wait for it every step of the way he could be totally obedient and he is he's doing what he's told talking to the Ninevites but he's doing it outside of the attitude that God wants us to have when we're presenting yeah he is the perfect example of taking the Lord's name in vain. He's doing the will that God sent him to do, but he's doing it in the wrong attitude. Yeah, his heart's not not in it. No. And, you know, I've heard this said, too, about the end of this book of Jonah, where it leaves us, you know, the questions, is it right for you to be angry about the plan? It is right for me to be angry even to death. And then, the, but the Lord said, you have had pity on the plant for which you have not labored, nor made it grow, which come up in the night and perished in the night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern their right hand from their left and much livestock. So when I look at that, the question of, and should I not pity Nineveh, and then the plant, okay, you're mad because about a plant. Right. That you put literally zero no effort into. And should I not pity Nineveh, a great city that I created. Right. And these are my people. You know. I God didn't build the city. It was purely out of rebellion that the city was built. But God still says, these are my people. Yes. Yep. Every single one of those human beings is made in my image. And you take pity on the plant? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> you know, and and we can and we can relate that to to things of today. You know, I 
I've said this before, you, you get in a car accident and you don't even think, wow, I'm still alive. You miss the miracle that you're still alive because you're worried about your car. There you go. You know, so that, that's kind of a modernization of how I look at that. But I've heard it said before that the book of Jonah was left like, of course, we don't know this answer. Theory right. is that the book of Jonah was left like this for us to meditate uh, and study and pray about that exact text right there before it goes into anything else. Just a theory that I had heard before, which... It's probably a good theory, but because that is what was practiced in Old Testament Judaism, yep. was to read the scripture, meditate on it, and then move forward with the rest of your day with it in mind. Yep. So, to be perfectly honest, that's less theory and more practical application. To yeah. be perfectly honest, that makes sense to yeah. me. I think what's interesting is God is making this point about the people, right? We all have people that we would rather be swallowed by a fish and escape or get on a boat, go away, than have to deal with them. It could be people at work. It could be in-laws. Yeah. It could be customers. Fortunately, I don't have the in-law problem. Yeah, me neither. (laughs) (laughs) But it, it could be... Any particular person, you who are listening right now, are part of a holy priesthood. If you are a believer, you are part of the very people of God now. Being under the blood of Christ is an incredible thing. And that, unfortunately, if you know you have the wrong attitude about it, means you can no longer sit on your butt. You have a responsibility now to say, do I take pity on my car or do I find out how the other person is doing? Yeah. Yep. Do I, do I bring the gospel to them? Even if it's in just a moment, not knowing what it might do, but be the representative that isn't Jonah, have the right heart about everything that you do, whether it's where you're going, how you're going, or what you're doing when you get there, you have to take the right attitude about all of it. If you are, say, younger, you're a teenager, and you've got parents that you feel like just ride you about everything, you feel like they drive you nuts, you know that they're doing it out of love, and you have trouble reconciling that. That doesn't mean that you begrudgingly do things. That means that you settle in your mind, my parents love me, they're doing this for my benefit, And I am going to do what they ask me, not because I've been told to, but because I know it's good for me. And, you know, that's where the Holy Spirit comes in, too, is when when you, you know, reconcile with God through the blood of Christ and the Spirit comes, it, it unsears your conscious. Yes. So at that point, you start to understand things in a different way. You see things from a different light. The fruits of the Spirit are now evident. Right. So in in this text, you know, and I've said this to, to Pastor Tom before, you can really tell when, when and I'll just say evangelist, yeah. when an evangelist is coming to you in a bad attitude versus in a good attitude. Yes. You can always tell, or whoever, you. I've sit there and I've watched people talk about Jesus from an unhappy perspective. Right. And then I watch people talk about it from a happy perspective. It's completely different mm-hmm. in the way that you interact with an unbeliever about Jesus. Kind of, that's what their whole experience hinges on. Yeah. You know, so when, when Jonah... It, you know, gives us, I'm sure it was a blistering message of the judgment is coming, repent, or right. die. Which is, by the way, totally warranted because it is coming. Yeah, right? it is coming, and, and we're living in that today. But on the other side of it, it was coming from the wrong heart. Yeah, and then he makes his camp and is almost is waiting for them to fail. Yeah. That's what he's waiting for. He's not. He's not sitting there waiting, you know, for... He's not going to sit there for 25 years and watch it. The city, he's waiting for it to fail. Yeah. Which eventually. Eventually it, it will. Eventually it does, but his heart wasn't right. No. And, and that, I, I, I can't help but wonder, maybe, would Jonah's heart being right 
have maybe changed that unanswered question to the right. of the world and, but and that's not that's something a, that we will ever have an answer no, to but that that's a great point could could Nineveh have been saved more long term if their first experience with a preacher had been you're in danger but somebody loves you and yep. somebody has sent someone to warn you ahead of time not you're all going to die in 40 days and and look at you know look at preacher our preachers today when you come to Christ they don't just get you there and leave no you know they're constantly praying over you preaching to you you know they're nurturing you in your walk with Christ not just hey judgments coming repent I am ahead out now right I'm sure they had multiple questions of you know what why us you know what's that gonna look like how do we you know even if the answer had been, I don't know, hearing it from the guy that yeah. presented the fire and brimstone would have meant the world to them. And, and I think that's a lesson to all of us. I take that very personally. Yeah. When I when you know we talk about that, I take that very personally because I can think of multiple times in my life where people have you know asked me about Christ, and I tell them, and whether they accept you know the sacrifice or not. Right. You're never, it's never talked about with that person again, or I never talked to that person again. It, it's just the persistence. It's the, you know, you look ahead into the New Testament, it's the guys that lowered their paralyzed friend down from the ceiling. Right. You know, how, and that on its own is going to be a podcast of how far are you willing to go? How persistent are you willing to be with this gospel? Are you going to give it once? Uh, they didn't really seem to like it. All right, I'm going to leave. Or are you going to press on, press on, pray over them, pray about it, and you know really stick to it? And because but, if you mattered to Jesus, then they matter to Jesus. Correct. Yep. And honestly, that's the whole like idea of this podcast. Yeah. Is you know we want to introduce you to the only true lasting hope of the world is Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. I. It's. That's it. <laughs> I mean, it's it's pretty straightforward. I mean, it is, and I mean, the Bible. It's a large and complex, technically, number of books. Yes, um, the scrolls were a little bulkier, so you know, us having it in paper form the way we do now is kind of incredible. And we get to see all of these different books and see them, you know, after the fact. But all of them have this ancient context to them. People were writing these. Yes, and had certain phrases that they used at the time that made more sense to them than they do to us, which is why this book is hard sometimes. Yeah. But that's why it's important to study it. You know, and, and this brings up another point for me too, is we have a Bible that we can preach and evangelize out of. The disciples, they didn't have squat. They just had eyewitness accounts and obviously they had the spirit, but they had nothing tangible. It wasn't a, I'm going to give you this pamphlet on, li- right. you know, literature on Jesus Christ. You can read about it, meditate on it, come back to me and with your decision. There wasn't that. It was testimony. It was testimony. It was these crazy guys running around the wilderness talking about this guy that half the world had never, three quarters of the world had never heard about. Right. And they weren't there. They didn't see it. They've never seen a guy die and come back before. Right. I mean, this is... I mean, I guess they technically did see it, like... They did. Once. Yep. But... And there's some interesting things about, like, why Jesus did some of his miracles a certain way. There are a lot of instances where he waits two days before he goes to do the miracle. In the instance of Lazarus, that's one of them, which is why everybody's so distraught when he gets there. But that'll be a totally different topic. Yeah. We'll get to that down the road. Yeah. And, you know, Pastor Tom talks about Eeyore. Right. Don't be an Eeyore. Oh. Yeah. I mean, when we... when we Guess they didn't accept Christ. No. <laughs> but the way we live is a testimony on its own. You know, we are to be a living testimony. Yes. You know, we have the greatest joy in the world, and that is to know that we are under the blood of Jesus. Yeah. You and I, 
very few of you listening to this were part of the chosen people of God, if you're listening at all. Those of you that are not part of the Jewish people, we were part of hundreds of nations that were all in direct rebellion against God, and he still said, I am going to take from my chosen people a man that will be my son. Yep. And my son, who has been with me since the beginning of time, I'm going to send him down to have human experience, experience pain, experience loss, experience sadness, sorrow, and go through all of the human experience just for you and die a horrible, painful death that he does not deserve. And you can read, you know, in Acts, I was, I was, while I was driving today, I was listening to the book of Acts on my Bible app, and that that's the transition yeah. point right there from Jews, strictly Jews, to every tongue, every nation. Like right. in the book of Acts, they explain that, you know, atonement is for everyone. Right. Jesus Thank said the to Lord. his disciples, you know, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, and into all the world. I think there's another one. Samaria. There. Samaria. Thank Samaria. you. Samaria. Samaria, by the way, was like the sort of intermediate area where there were Jews that had mixed with Gentiles, and that was a really complicated place. Yeah. They already hated Samaria. It was a complicated relationship. So <laughs> so to get beyond Samaria at all was un- unthinkable to them. But that's just incredible that Jesus started his ministry in the vicinity of the Jews and started with the Jews. Salvation comes to the Jews first and then to the Gentiles. And most of the Jews rejected him. Yeah. Yep. And now we have the opportunity to accept him and to say, and by the way, for those of you who are struggling a little bit with, you know, does this Jesus thing actually matter? A, we know he historically existed. B, we have more historical attestation to him than any other historical figure, more than Alexander the Great, more than Julius Caesar, more than... Seriously, it's ridiculous. Yep. We have over 4,500 New Testament documented different fragments. The, the amount of evidence for the Old Test, New Testament is staggering. And the fact that we now get to say, this Jesus, right, who was the only man in the world to claim to be the Son of God, who in every other religion is said, yes, that is a great prophet, you should listen to him. If everybody else is saying he's a great prophet, you should listen to him. And he himself said, I am the way, yep. the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. I'm thinking it's pretty imperative yeah. we follow this guy. Yeah. Yeah, that... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that's a good point. You know, that's why, you know, you look at Every other Lord, right? What is? This? I don't know what I don't know what your other lords do for you, but mine died for me that yeah. I might be saved. Like that's like the ultimate G right there. You know, right. he's yeah. the original G. He's the G. So at that point, it's like you know, yeah, <laughs> it, and, it blows my mind. And this is a whole other topic. People argue about Jesus being mythologized in tandem with other like deities, specifically sun deities. Do not listen to that. It's bunk. It comes from an early 2000s production called Zeitgeist. It has zero sources to it. Don't trust it. If somebody uses that as a talking point, dismiss it and immediately start doing research. Exit room, right. <laughs> <laughs> Trust me, I'm, I'm not saying this because it's not worth listening to. I'm saying this because I have listened to it, and I did the research. And it's not and worth listening to. <laughs> then I realized it's not worth listening yeah. to. It's, I, at one point, I did actually believe that, and you know, we could get into my testimony at a whole other episode. We could have an episode just about testimony. Yeah. But at, at, trust me, the story of Jesus is, in, its, in and of itself, miraculous compared to the entire ancient Near Eastern world. It is separate and distinct. It does not steal from other cultures. What they did do is they would read ancient stories, and that's where you get some of the parts of the Bible that are a little hard, like Jude references ancient literature that 
is a little difficult, which is why people read Jude and eh, it's a little confusing. But again, ancient context comes into play. It's important to remember that everything that you're reading in the Bible was written by somebody who had a totally different, didn't have a smartphone, yeah. didn't have access to a Bible. They had the Old Testament scrolls, and you had to be in the synagogue to read those. Yeah. And, and you had to be, frankly, a rabbi yeah. to read them aloud in front of everybody. It's, there's so much that we could talk about. But just know that if you have had any experience with Jesus, you're already blessed. Yeah. Yep. And at, like you said, access to Bibles. I'm going to plug put a plug in here for the community Bible craze. We're collecting uh, Bibles and Christian literature by donation. If that's something that you want to donate to, uh, you can send me a message on Facebook, YouTube, and uh, we'll get you all set up. So feel free to donate. Thank you for your consideration and donating. But uh, I think we're out of time for today. Uh, thank you guys for listening. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our YouTube and our Spotify. And we'll catch you next time on the Lasting Hope Podcast.